that's it. Okay. Um, so, hi, everybody. Um, glad you could come. We are, uh, this is being streamed live onto YouTube. It's being recorded and archived. Um, so don't forget to have your uh, cell phones silenced. All right, so um, we'll begin now. And um, so my name is Sean Barnes. I'm the uh, gallery coordinator at the Leonore R. Fuller Gallery here at South Puget Sound Community College um, inside the Kenneth J. Menart Center for the Arts. And uh, tonight we have the, uh, the pleasure of uh, honoring uh, Nishiki Sugawara Beda, a uh, visiting artist uh, from Texas. And um, I'll tell you more about Nishiki in a minute. Uh, first. Um, as usual, we have a, an acknowledgement, and just to remind folks that we, uh, South Puget Sound Community College is located on the ancestral lands of the Stachos Band of the Squaxin Indian Tribe and the Nisqually Indian Tribe, who have long been stewards of the region's waters, plants, and animals. Uh, the southernmost point of the Salish Sea these lands were and still are a place of gathering, trade, and community for many Coast Salish peoples. We recognize that all who are not Salish peoples are visitors here. We commit to join these peoples to share uh, in their history, build relationships, increase representation, and restore the living world around us. One of the ways that uh, South Puget Sound Community College and the Leo Fuller Gallery honors this acknowledgement is through our uh, annual Native American art exhibition. And this year will be our 15th year um, working with uh, makers, artists, and curators from uh, regional tribes. Um, this year's exhibition is honoring uh, Chehalis weaver Hazel Pete and Hazel Pete's legacy uh, with basket weaving in the Pacific Northwest and even beyond a little bit uh, California area and sharing that, uh, her weaver's knowledge. That exhibition opens November 13th. Uh, there's a reception uh, honoring Hazel Pete, and um, you can see the work and visit with some of the makers. They will be here. Um, and the artist talk, there'll be an artist talk on Monday, November 27th at 6 p.m. And so some of Hazel Pete's ancestors, descendants who are weavers and who are carrying forward that, that craft and tradition will be present for that talk as well. So, on to the hour at hand, and matter of hand. Um, Nishiki Sugawara Beda is a Japanese-American visual artist based in painting and installation, and actively exhibits her work in solo and group exhibitions, and offers lectures nationally and internationally. Connecting across space and time, she experiments in ancient Japanese materials and techniques, including sumi ink, uh, kakejuku, kakejuku, landscapes and rice paper to merge them with abstract and expressive forms familiar to the Western aesthetic. Nishiki has exhibited around the country at the Spartanburg Art Museum in South Carolina, Morris Graves Museum of Art, California, we love Morris Graves up here, uh, Denos Museum in Michigan, Amos Eno Gallery in New York, and the Chris Worley Fine Arts Gallery in Texas. Publications include New American Paintings, AEQAI, uh, is that Merrick? What is that? The, that's the name of the Okay. Uh, interesting, I'll have to check that out. Uh, Athenium Review, London Post, Art Spiel, and White Hot. Some awards uh, include a Seed Grant, Diversity Fellowship, International Enhancement Grant, Idaho Arts Fellowship, Sam Taylor Fellowship, the Tucson Talk Foundation Residency, and Dallas Museum of Art, Otis and Thelma Davis Dozier Travel Fund, and they've all supported her artistic research. Her works are in the private and public collections, including the Dallas Museum of Art, so if you're ever in Dallas, go in there and see if that piece is on exhibit. And currently, uh, Nishiki is an associate professor of art at Southern Methodist University in Dallas. So without further ado, please welcome Nishiki Subhumara Beda. Oh, incidentally, let me just jump in here real quick. Um, I, f I, always, I forget this sometimes, but uh, so you will talk for a little bit, 
and then there'll be an opportunity to fo for folks to ask questions, and we can have a little conversation about the work. So, as uh, Nishiki is giving giving her talk, you know, maybe think about things that she's saying and what you're seeing here in the gallery, and and um, and perhaps you can formulate a question or two, or or even just a comment and a statement about the work is fine. And then we can have the opportunity to look at the work. We'll move these chairs and the projector up or the, the camera out of the way so you all can get a full immersive experience with this project. I also want to say thank you to, uh, we have two students here that uh, Josh and uh, Vekos, Vekos? Vekros. Vekros, my bad. Um, uh, they helped with installing the little parts and pieces of this exhibition carefully, uh, climbing the ladder and holding these pieces so that Nishiki can, can assess and evaluate and edit the work. So um, give a little round of applause for these two students for, for helping us out. Um, they are Japanese one students um, here on our campus, so it's really nice to have uh, interdisciplinary um, interactions to build relationships and community on our campus. Um, there were also a few other students from uh, some art classes that helped out. Um, I don't see those students here tonight, but you know, I'll talk to them when I see them in the hallways. Well, um, first of all, thank you, Sean, for um, arranging all that stuff in Q. You know how much uh, work you, um, you kind of thoughts and focus that you put uh, for me, and I really, really, really appreciate it. And then also, thank you so much for coming all. Beautiful weather outside, and uh, you know, having to spend some time in, indoor, so um, that speaks a lot. So um, I'd like to talk about Kotodama covers, which is this abstract sculpture, but I'm a, a painter, and I, I will talk about painting a little bit because I want you to know. And by talking about paintings, I believe you understand why I do this. And as she said, it's the ba uh, based in painting and sort of sculptural installation, but I only make one sculptural installation, which is this. So I'm a painter, I paint a lot, but one sculptural installation that I started in 2012 and continuously sort of different forms and shapes and different iterations. And this is my uh, fifth iteration and I was a little nervous, but I think it's, it's, a, it's again successful uh, all because of you know, everybody's help. So my name is Nishiki sugawara Dera. I'm based in Dallas, Texas. And just start from this little uh, picture. So I'm from that, the, here, uh, Japan, right here. And all the red dot represents the places where I have been and I sort of worked, mostly traveling and a little bit of help here and there. But the blue one is the place where I have been for the last 20 some years. Um, and then I wanted to just touch here because um, it, you, it will make sense later. So in Japan, it's tiny living room. If you can just imagine, like Japan, we have a smaller land. Big room just show up um, in the middle of the living room because my mother wanted to make a cushion cover. And he, uh, she didn't um, buy the cushion cover, but she uh, wanted to make you know, her own. But she didn't, you know, she didn't buy a fabric. She just wanted to make the fabric. And she got a silk. And the silk came with a, you know, sort of whitish silk to begin with. And she wanted to have some colors. So, you know, dye. And she needs to, you know, maybe um, uh, indigo or onion, um, onion skin. But um, she decided to raise some indigo in a pot outside. And, but she didn't stop there. She's just like, ah. Oh, where the silk is from. So she, um, she started to raise some silkworm. Only, you know, it's like maybe five or six silkworms, and then you can't really get that uh, silk out of it, but we get that cocoon. So you know, just, she just needed to go through that, the, the whole experience. And, you know, I'm saying that's just my mother, and I'm the daughter. And you will see later why that, that relationship is really strong. Um, another image that I want to show you is the calligraphy. In Japanese calligraphy, uh, you might know, but you think about word. 
and then you transmit that meaning of the word using the shape of the character. And that part is really, um, it really resonates with me for mug making in painting. Even small kids uh, make that. And my daughter, who are there, she also does that uh, calligraphy as well. It's not more about learning character. It's more about transmit that meaning really through the shape One day, it was 2007, um, I had been, so around that time I was painting figures, like lots of figures, and I wanted to master that sort of figurative paintings. And I, you know, I was sort of getting, getting it, but I didn't, like, I didn't know what I wanted to say with it. You know, like, okay, beautiful figures, maybe get the emotion out of it, but is that the one that I want to shout out to the world? I was not sure, but, I was really sure about how I want to really express. The how was coming from my heart, authentic, sort of faithful, sort of transmission of my heart to the, uh, the surface of the painting. So I used the word kokoro no nakakara, that's in Japanese, translated to uh, from my heart or from the center of my heart, because that's what I wanted to do. So I started to use drizzle, like using the same word over and over, and I didn't take that thing out, so it became scribble, and the scribble became a form, and using the form to represent what I was talking about, which is something coming out. I'm not sure what I want to say, but again, I'm exploring the how. And I started using more words or phrases. This is arigato in Japanese. So you can sort of, if you know the uh, hiragana, you can make out arigato. That's the proud area. It's, uh, it's thank you in Bulgaria. And so all my friends are coming from different places. One friend is from Bulgaria, so I use that their own language, but phonetically in Japanese uh, character. The little, uh, little details, those are the ones that I just love. And I think the kind of kimono culture probably, I'm drawn to the little details. And that's two, two letters, yaru, which is okay. I do or do. I have been, at that time, I was exploring the idea of decision making. And that's a la la la. It's like after you know, going through the decision making process, it's sometimes very hard, right? And, uh, but it's just right after the decision was made. And you can see really colorful. Each color speaks to one another. And I was using those color schemes to speak to a certain culture or certain time range. And then just maybe a couple of images that I just show you. That's how I would be doing uh, around that time, 2014, 2015. So you can sort of see that the letters. So I have the letters or phrases and another nuance come in, and then using uh, those patterns or colors to sort of navigate through those layers that I created it. And then 2016. So at the end of 2015, my daughter was born, so I became someone else, which is somehow like mother. And it's sort of like big things, and I wanted to explore something, Again, I don't, I didn't know, but I just sort of dropped that color and speak to just maybe one or two colors. And sumi just came more pronoun because it's that, it, you know, I have been using sumi and sumi is that Asian ink for calligraphy, but it's the black ink. And maybe introduce one or two colors so that to see maybe new colors coming in as a new me. And then this is another version. It's one sumi color with one another color to explore some ideas. And these are the, uh, this is the one of the uh, current work. So it's exclusively sumi now. So I have four paintings in the back. Uh, that's all sumi. 
And you can see, Sumi is just wonderful. I'm, I need to talk about Sumi because I'm kind of obsessed with it. But you can see that's the sort of color of the translucent color. But some of them, maybe not here. This, these are little scratches that you can sort of take out uh, the ink. But um, perhaps this is sort of difficult to see, but some of the places become the uh, opaque gray. So um, I hope you can you can maybe visit my website and have a look. But these are the, uh, the painting side of my practice, and which is actually pretty much main. And um, I wanted to talk about Sumi a little bit. This is my like backbone sort of mission. Sumi is soot and animal glue. And do you guys know what soot is? Right. I didn't know actually. <laughs> so you burn things and the smoke comes out and you collect that a white, a black powder. And that soot, and depends on what you burn and how you burn and how you collect, it determines the color of black. So black, like it's black, but there's a temperature shift, um, translucency shift. It's very wonderful mediums. On the left side, that's the bokuju, it's the uh, already liquid form of sumi uh, in the bottle. But the animal glue part is uh, it's a weak, it's mostly um, a lacquer in it, and it's very different uh, sumi. So you can actually buy those things, uh, but I cannot feel like that's the sumi that I should call. So those are the uh, sumi stick. It's a different sizes that comes in. I think I have. Oh, this is the different shapes of sumi stick. Well, and maybe you don't call it sumi stick. But that is the one that you, uh, you put a little bit of a drop of water on the stone called suzuri, and then mix it or like rub it to make an ink. So again, it's different shapes of sumi. And um, if you can remember my mother, so she needed to go through the process. She really wanted to understand what the material is about. So I went to Nara, Japan, where 95% of Japanese sumi is being produced, just because I really wanted to know what that is. And you can see a variety of colors here. And like, uh, right here, that's a little bit bluish. I think those three are actually blue dye in it. But the rest of it is just a slightly different color right here. That's, it just soot and animal glue, but really depends on what you burn. So if, when you burn oil, you get um, brownish, reddish, uh, uh, black. And when you burn wood, it tends to become a bluish. This is a rare picture. So you, um, in the, in the Kobayan, it's the place, the name of the uh, sumi shop. He, they, they are the only one that make their own soot in, in Nara. And uh, soot is a pigment for painters, right? It's a, and it, it's a secret business. You can't really go to this place unless you beg and you go there every day for about two weeks and then they're like, okay, you can come in. <laughs> so I finally went to be able to visit that place. So one person attending this tiny little room, adjacent to it, exact same room. So 200 here, 100 there, 200 little uh, station, and you're burning oil, and that's that, that wood maybe you might not be able to see, but the uh, clay did, and then the other side is the soot. So he has to attend every 15 minutes or so, uh, turn the lid so that the evenly collect the soot and then adding the uh, uh, oil. I'm not going into detail, but it's fascinating. Uh, this is how they make soot, uh, the sumi stick. And, uh, and that's their different uh, sizes. It comes in different shapes as well. It is a hard process. Um, oftentimes, those people who make su uh, sumi, they devote their life to protect that, that craft, uh, craft. So um, it, 
it's cherished. It's a, it's a very respected craft, but it's so hard that the people who do make um, the, the number started to increase. And it's a very sad. So I, want, I really wanted to sort of, that's the mission of explaining things to the out there. Because um, Japanese people, they know, they, they, they love these, but they're not really using it. Because, you know, you're taking them all. It's like, oh, wait a minute, let me, let me make my ink. You know, you, you don't have time, right? So, um, uh, but it's a beautiful uh, culture developed, and I want somehow uh, this culture to, to, to flourish or continue. Um, and then again, I want you to remember it's my mother's story. I needed to make my own suit. So this is my first version. Just, you know, my uh, working with my chemistry uh, professor, and was like, oh, can, I, can I make a, um, a suit? So I'm burning to get the suit. This is the first version. And the second version, so you know, it was slightly better, right? And, um, and then I got a lot of suit. And I collected. And then you can see on the left, that's the first try, second try. So I'm, I became much better. And I had occasion to burn even like, um, now with wood. So I went to Michigan and, um, and I was able to collect three kinds of wood. Red pine, white pine, and cedar. And each one of them, each one of them I spent 18 to 16 hours of burning. Every eight minutes, I'm attending. Um, but I got the formula down. So it's a burn and collecting soot by brushing off. And this is the first uh, soot making. This is about eight hours. Really, really thin layers. I thought it was like maybe one gram, but not even one gram. This is the second. Can you see the difference between them? See? It's more. And, uh, well, I became a little bit more efficient. And if you, if you can just sort of see this color, it's very oily. But um, this was, is the, uh, I believe this is a white pine. And that's the cedar. Maybe it's just very difficult to see on this, in this picture, but it was a little bit more sandy-like. So again, like now I feel it. it's like each one of the uh, wood or a different materials uh, will produce different soot and therefore different color. Um, in, at the director's place, he was burning wood, like local wood at the chimney and, uh, and then creel salt all over in the chimney, right? And but just coming from the local wood. It's like, okay, so I could collect that. And um, I collect some and then you know grind it on the glass molar. And it, this powder was uh, very fine. Uh, went through uh, two layers of surgical masks. And then I made my own sumi stick. It's very humble looking. But I needed to know more, so I asked my physicist friend in France, and like, just can you just measure for me? So remember the, the fine powder of creole salt? It went through two layers of surgical mask. That's 85 nanometers, that's a me medium, uh, uh, me what do you call it? Uh, the, the, the side. But he also um, was able to measure the pine, uh, pine like red pine, white pine soot. So 85 nanometer versus 1.73. So that's a super, super small particle. So, um, and that's a white pine, five, but still it's much, much smaller than 80. And so I started thinking that like you burn things and then like a tiny little particle that has come out, that feels like that's the, the essence of like all could be like maybe we could say it's spirit of that the wood. And then the wood is coming from that local place, which means that it's coming from that the, the, the soil. You know, it just feels like I'm really taking out some sort of 
essence or you know, like a, the, the last bit of core of the land. Uh, this is paper, and that the first red line, that's the contact of the brush. And because it's such a fine particle, it all the way to there to, to travel through the fiber of paper. And at that place, I sort of like, okay, I am getting the pigment from that, that specific place. Maybe I could just try to use that, the pigment to represent that specific place. So I put the paper and then get the impression of beautiful stone, which is very famous in Michigan shore, a Michigan lake shore, and use the animal glue, uh, glue brush to get the impression and bring, bring it to uh, on my desk and sprinkle the uh, creole salt. And then I made a bunch of them and make the, uh, the paintings out of it. But instead of the abstract shape, I was able to use that direct observation as a method of painting or image making. Japan is the country where I'm from. And you see which flag is that? Do you, do you, uh, you know flag, flag? Yes. Yes, that's, that's the Pol Polish flag. And so I'm from Japan, and that's where my spouse is from, and then America as a background. And that's, that's where my uh, sort of culture of my household, and I needed to understand Japanese culture. Maybe I was doing that through my research. I'm not really talking about all, but all, many of them, uh, much of my research is based on Japanese traditional activities. So I needed to go to Poland to really understand where my spouse is coming from, but not asking him to, to tell me, but going there. So I went to Łódź, Poland, where the, uh, uh, most of uh, his youth were spent there. And um, in Szymanski Academy of Fine Arts, Łódź, um, they, they welcomed me <laughs> as an artist. Artist, like this, you know, artist, and I chose Schmalzwitze, which is south, uh, southwest of Warsaw, sort of in between of uh, Woods and Warsaw. It's an abundance of beautiful nature and lots of wood. So I went to um, someone's backyard and then collecting some wood. But that my 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 thing is not about okay. This is time is the red pine. It it was about the wood that has come from that particular land or bucket. So I made my, uh, my own soup making beautiful process and I made fire. And early June in Poland, it was cold and people had to, you know, coats. And you know, as soon as I started making fire, the neighborhood kids and you know, all the family, they started coming in. And you know, it's a communal thing. It's beautiful, but I had to do this in order to get my sit. So I have to control the, the I, I feel bad because they were here to just warm, you know, promise of warmth there, but actually there's no really a fire. And it constantly I have to just come in front of it to turn. Remember, like eight minutes <laughs> interval. And it's like, it's a really fun being around here. And um, so that the plastic container, and that's the place where I was collecting the soot. And you can see a few times of soot collection on the left side. Ten hours later, I got quite a bit of soot. And then I went to a place called near Volvo. It's pretty close to Schmalzbitze. But this place, this on the, the left side, that was uh, built in um, early 1900, uh, and uh, the German family uh, was living there until 1946, uh, Edward Kimpin. 
and I went inside. It's a, it became a museum, by the way. Uh, and then there was a, a, a stove. Um, can you guess what I did? <laughs> of course, because there was a fire right inside, um, and it was not used. And I was able to collect some clear salt from that. Um, so it was really interesting. So like you, you reach into the, uh, the, the stove, and it felt like I was communicating with someone who was there like 60, 70 years ago in the same position, but through the medium of uh, Creole salt. And um, I had a mask only, so a mask became that for my container. And I'm sharing this this uh, images because I kind of felt it when I was installing this installation. You know, I was painting it, but at the same time, I needed help. And uh, with the help, I was, you know, I, I was trying to collect this suit, and it became a community uh, activity. And so, as this uh, sculpture, it became, you know, sort of commu communal aspect. When you guys are helping me, we were talking, small talks here and there, but you started understanding that the personality and uh, the, the view of the world here and there, and it was very interesting. And I want to talk about the Kotogama Converse because you know, it's, it's the show is happening. Koto means word, dama means spirit. Kotogama and Converse. The reason that I made that sculpture was that if you could just start going back to uh, the very beginning of the, my talk, calligraphy, you know, you, you think about the word and you, you transmit the meaning using the shape. So I wanted to know the shape of that particular, like a, a word spirit. Could be anything, but I wanted to see what, what that, that could be you know, in a tangible form. And that's how, that's why I started to making the, uh, the movie strip. So each one of them is a movie strip. In calligraphy, a seal one, that's called kamboin. Seal two, like stamp, that's the name. The third one is pen name. And the fourth one is called yu in, it's sort of play in. And each six uh, seals are sort of a stage making for the word to shine or speak. So what happening in this Kododama Converse is that there's no content, no word. So I'm hoping and um, I'm aiming for the viewers and visitors like you are coming in physically but emotionally can be the content or can be the, the sort of agent to complete the work. A little bit of process. These are uh, rice paper. Chicken wire has been used inside and then each one of that paper was carefully applied as a paper mache. And I made a bunch of them, and you can see it's about 100, a little over 100 of them. And each one of them have a little hook, so that a fish, fishing line um, can hang the sculpture. And then in the middle, uh, there's a line of seals. So I'm borrowing the, the placement and the meaning of seals to create the stage for the word or us to enter, and uh, all of them are something to do with communication. If you do read a uh, Chinese character, uh, you can sort of you know, see that. But maybe, maybe like that second character, both of them, same shape, and that means heart. That's emerge, that's something to do with, uh, to, to, to tell or to communicate. The, the third one from the, from the left is a friendship. So something to do with connection or uh, yeah, the communication. 
And that's the first uh, second iteration. And maybe this is the third one. And that's the fourth one. And then we have a fifth one. And again, um, that's my daughter there. The reason that I put this image, this is from the, uh, the, the second iteration, but this happened <laughs> in this room. Thank you, Petros, and thank you, Josh, and thank you, Sean, for me uh, to go up the ladder many times, and then they helped me to secure the spot. Um, I do have a really painful finger today. Um, and, then, and then I wanted to bring this image again. This was the, uh, the burning, like trying to create the, uh, the suit. Many people came. And again, like when I was installing this, many people came and it gave uh, 30 minutes, maybe 20 minutes here and there to, um, to, to, to make this installation possible. So thank you so much. So I did bring the uh, book. That's the book. Um, it's, a, it's a combination of completion, a compilation of works from 2012 to 2020. I have uh, some books available there. Um, if you have a chance, please have a look. Um, again, I'm Japanese, right? Like from heart, like I eat everything. It's, it's like, you know, something always Japanese. But like right here, some American happening. So like English and Japanese two language bilingual book is very, was uh, very important. So inside there is the uh, essay in English, but all, all of them is translated uh, professionally to Japanese. Thank you so much for your time. Hey, thank you, thank you, Nishiki. And um, you all are welcome to hang out and uh, you know explore this this beautiful piece. Um, we'll get the chairs out of the way, move the camera so you all can move freely. Uh, there are some snacks and refreshments out front. If you guys like some of those, and if you're going downtown for Arts Walk this evening, we'll be here until about 7:30, 7, you know, maybe 8 o'clock if we have a lot of people in here. So you can send people this way if they're looking for more to to experience. Thank you all for coming, really appreciate it. And thank you. Thank you, thank you. If you have a question, I'm here. Oh, yes, yes. Okay. You didn't mention the paper. Do you make your own paper as well? Oh, that's a great question. So for this work, I did not make, but I did make some papers. So um, when I was in um, Poland, um, Eva, Eva, Eva Padreshika. I think I'm just butchering her name. But uh, there's a pa pa paper studio, and um, I made a blueberry sandwich with charcoal because I, you know, I after you burn, and there is a charcoal, right? It's like, oh, that's great. So blueberry sheet. If you know the paper making process, it's the scooping the uh, the fiber and to the floor uh, to the felt sprinkle my own charcoal, and then another blueberry, yes. So, uh, you know, maybe I've done like only a couple times, so I'm not like, again, paper maker, but I wanted to sort of go through the process, but after going through the process, made me more like understand the pa uh, painting surface. So I layered my painting surface, many, many layers, and peeled it off, and that, Kind of spoke the paper paper making process spoke to me in that way. Yeah, thank you. And and I apologize, but if there are any questions, we can take those questions now. I kind of got ahead of kind of kind of ahead of the cart there. Um, so if anyone else has any questions, um, feel free. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you want to use the the, the thing so that? Let's talk from you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, question: yeah. Is there like a certain place? For Do I do I have a specific wood yeah. that I, I really yeah, like? Yeah. yeah. Um, so far, so far, with showdown is not yet. I mean, like, what is available? And uh, and then start burning, and then like 
see the differences, and that in just itself is really exciting. I think, um, but thank you for the uh, question, because I don't think I'm going for the specific wood. It's more about specific location. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Any other comments or questions? I, I have a question. Oh, Humber, go ahead. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just with the reds, is it a staff that you're using? Just with it, are you using those yourself? Right, so did I, do, I, do I make that stamp? Yes, I did. Um, so the, the traditional stamp are soapstone, and it's pretty easy to make. Um, it's called shuin and hakuin. So the, if you carve, the letter that becomes hakui, which is white letter. If you cut out the outside of the letter, then it becomes red line. And um, I used the uh, soft stone, but also I used the step uh, eraser as well. Yeah, and it's pretty, very forgiving and very easy. Uh, one of the summer, um, usually during the summer, I go back to Japan and then do research uh, one of the um, traditional activities, flower arrangement, chado, which is the tea ceremony, and tenkoku, which is the uh, seal making. So tenkoku was one of that year, you know, maybe five, five, six years ago. Yeah. Uh, how many pieces are there and are you planning on making more? Yeah. How many pieces do I have or planning to make? I was just talking to my husband. Um, like after we see this, like, do I, do I need more now? <laughs> so I feel like I want to make more, but at the same time, uh, yeah, so number wise, it's about, I, I didn't count carefully, but I know that it's over 100. Um, and then just anecdote, so those are movie strip, so none of them collapse like nicely, or stuck nicely. So when I ship these work, um, it feels like I'm shipping the air because in a big box there are maybe three or four. So Shaw has to deal with all the many, many numbers of boxes. Yeah, I think there were 16, 16 <laughs> boxes like this. Yeah. And then also the, the drop ceiling you made special for this space. So the ceiling that you saw in some of the other installations were specific to that space. And I think in some instances it was already a part of the ceiling. Yeah. Yes, yeah. And so this was made um, especially for this, which came in a really big box. And um, there are 20, 20, no, 30, yeah. right? 30 yeah. uh, separate frames that are, that we assembled and then they're all clipped up to the ceiling. So, so that's one of the questions that I have for you, is um, if you could talk a little bit about uh, making the shift, I guess, from labor to the creative process, because the, the you know, gathering the soot, grinding, mixing, and then making each stamp, Better applying carefully. Can you talk about that? Thank you for the questions. Um, labor, yes. Um, this is definitely a labor intensive work. Um, would you hold that? Or do, is it, do you think this is related? Okay. Um, it, it, Yes, I mean, like if I count the hours, I don't know actually. Um, so again, I started in 2012, so it's just like a slow process of getting there. But the labor, maybe, maybe that's the maybe that's not the word that maybe I should use because it's it's the time that I spent and the time that I'm just thinking about the work itself. Sometimes I go very like meditative mood. But especially for paintings, like if I do really quick marks and then it feels like it's done, I just love to spend on the surface, so I just tend to do more things and slow little tiny marks. Um, so I, I, I think it's the, yeah. You know, I remember you mentioned that, again, I didn't really think deeply, but the, 
I guess when students put the labor, feels to me that's like a forced labor or like something more, um, like a, a, a little bit more negative connotation, like you do things to get paid or something like that. But again, this is the, um, you know, nobody, nobody told me what to do. <laughs> this is just something like just the love. And I, I just view it as an opportunity to spend more time with what I do so that when I'm doing this, um, it, uh, I, I know that the right, um, it, it's right. So like keep questioning, it's like, why am I doing this? And yeah, I, I like this. And sometimes I don't question and just doing it because I like it. Um, I guess I'm not really answering the question beautifully, but. Oh no, I think you, I, I think you nailed it right at the beginning. I, I thank you and I appreciate that, that clarification of the distinction between labor and time spent. Because I, 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 I struggle with that as an artist myself sometimes. It's like, is this giving me what I need? But I, I think sometimes that's the wrong, that is the wrong perspective to have, that we have to shift a little bit as artists. And, you know, this is about spending and developing a relationship with material and a space and seeing where that goes. Bartosz, did you have a question? Or yeah. Yes. Um, how do you uh, decide about the shape of installation? How do you? Also, another question that is related would you uh, trust somebody to install it or you have to do it? Oh, that's a great question. So, they, um, how do I decide the shape and would, would, would I um, trust somebody to install? Completely without your presence. Right, and I think that's probably shown as I. Definitely no, because I really felt it. So on Wednesday night, um, I was a little bit nervous. Okay, can I can I finish this installing? And I, I knew that I wanted to push that that uh, Wednesday night to 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 stay here to finish like you know the, the big shape. And um, it, it became obvious like as as much as like, you know this this act of making is communal. Um, I felt that it's, it's, a, it's a painting process. And painters here um, understand painting is very solitary um, activity. Like you're by yourself. There's no communal about it. It's like me and me and another me talking to each other. So um, if, if I ask somebody to make, I think it, it becomes collaboration. So I, I don't think it, I can call it like my work. Um, and uh, for the shape, I think I have to react to the, the actual space. So when I came here, uh, before I came here, my mind was sort of the centers, like symmetrical kind of a shape. But because there, there's a space, I knew it, but I didn't, I didn't make it, but that space was a little bit more pronounced for me. Um, so I needed to have that, like, uh, the tailor or a tail to, to finish it that way. Did I answer a question? <laughs> and then I had, yeah. to see someone's art, like you get a lot of inspiration. Like, oh, I could do that, but I could do, you know, instead of A, kind of A dash, that kind of thing, yeah. yeah so I'm glad that you came here, thank you. I, I'd like to, to add on to uh, a question Bartosz had, and just our experience together, we, and, and for you all to understand like how something like this comes together, um, we were talking about a year and a half ago um, about bringing this installation. And I, I, I remember, I was thinking about this today, I remember we, when, I, when we got in touch with each other and we were talking over Zoom, I think, or over phone, and um, I was like, well, we, we'd like to have this here. And you were kind of like, really? What um, is this? <laughs> and, um, but we've had, we had lots of discussions about bringing this piece here. And 
one of the things that, that was very important to you and, and to making this happen was that you were here to install. Typically, when an exhibition comes into this gallery space, and it's, it's similar to a lot of other you know, museums and galleries, the work is shipped in, the artist may have some instructions for something um, uh, less uh, complex, and so then the, the preparator or, or the curator installs that, that piece. But oftentimes with installations like this, the artist is, needs to be present in the space and to see the space and respond to the space. So even though this, you, know, you were showing images of it in these other spaces, it's different every time this is gonna be installed. And today I was kind of thinking, I'm sitting here thinking this morning, and I was like, what if this was sent with instructions? What might that look like? <laughs> And I was like, okay, grid panel five, grid two E gets this, and this fishing line would need to be eight inches long at fishing line three on object four. The, the, the instructions would be just maniacal, worse than stereo instructions. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But so when, you know, conceptual artist, that's his work. So he creates the simple steps, and then the people will, you know, ex execute. So that is that art. I think it's mine is different. Yes. <laughs> this brings me to another question I had for you, um, and uh, and and I think it it relates to this in a lot of ways. But could you talk about the shift from painting to three dimensional sculpture? Well, that's a, uh, again, that's a great question. I, you know, as I said, I'm a painter with one sculpture installation. And uh, the idea coming from my painting practice, but the visual, like formal decisions, is, is really pretty much painting. So it takes uh, 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 quite many views, so it, which means that 360 views of painting that I'm painting. No, actually. Yeah, 360 plus another, what do you call those? All, like top and bottom, and right and left. So like I am constantly doing this. Oh, I just felt that the muscle ache because I have been doing this. So like run one, say, one side, another top and bottom, and then how the, the, in the, the, the space, one sculpture is floating in which direction? Like what's the energy that like, moving toward and um, so like it is for me painting like again like painting in a 3d format like very slow process but um, yeah that's what i felt when i was making it and i believe that uh, you had a question yeah i hope i didn't miss this why the mobius strip shapes oh why do i use the mobius strip um, it, uh, the answer is simple it's the friendship that I wanted to make sure that uh, the friendship is, is going in, infinite. Because, um, um, you know, I, I moved from Japan to the uh, United States, and, you know, the, when you go to a foreign country, like all the friends uh, become family. And so they were very important to me, and, uh, and then I wanted that, and I'm hoping to, to sort of create that, that infinite, like okay, family just won't go away. Um, your friend, friend, I didn't want my friends to you know, go away. So that's how I started that, that shape. And a conversation with a physicist uh, professor a uh, long time ago, um, and that's how I became. So like, yeah, he, you know, like my work from the Bulgaria one, like Rodaria, the paintings, in thank you. I also have Termakasi, which is Malice in thank you. <laughs> that's like things like that. I, and one other follow-up question to the painting thing. Do you feel that um, working with the sculpture has uh, changed or informed your painting practice in some way? Oh, that's, oh, that's an excellent question. I always think about the painting and the sculpture. Um, I think similarly, I was not sort of conscious but like, uh, when I was talking about paper, I think that's kind of how I, uh, how I 
hill. So the starting from far away, I'm looking at it, and I know the relationship from, with, with what I see in front of it to there. But in my painting, I sort of, um, you know, I, I'm conscious about that space in my you know, nanometer <laughs> surface world. So I, I, I think I'm not conscious about it, but like when, you, you, when you ask, I think that's how I like, um, think about it. Because layers and layers, and then I, I, I try to navigate through those layers, and sometimes I think about it as an inch and or 100 yards. So I, I guess I'm thinking about it. Yeah, that's interesting to think about um, time in relation to surface layers and build up, a kind of geology, deep time yeah. of, of yeah. the material and. Yeah. yeah. And it's such a such a tiny space I'm talking about. But you know, when I scratch, I feel like hello, you know. But the the, the layers that I did you know, a couple months ago, I'm revealing it again. Any other questions? Uh, so that the, the sculpture is related to the space, and then the sculpture related to the viewers, and uh, I think that was the, just the sort of area that I should talk about. But um, this, um, he's my husband, and it's just making me a lot of difficult questions, which is so appreciative. Thank you. <laughs> but the, the the viewer comes, or like the, the whoever comes. I don't know, when I say viewer, it just feels like I, I'm like up here or something. But like someone come, and um, um, the, the relationship with the sculpture is, is uh, it, it, I think physical, physicality of the sculpture is, um, it, it is important. Like we have, a lot of information and images on a flat screen, and in a nowadays virtual world, um, I, I, I think the virtual world is maybe maybe similar, but I think we still have that physicality, like the earning for a um, uh, physicality. Although we, I'm not probably asking people to touch, but there's a, the sense of um, uh, a presence there, and once you start looking at it you know somebody made that sculpture. Because um, when, you, when you see closely, like paper are attached to each other, it's not machine made. Um, I'm hoping that the, the presence of someone's hand, um, it triggers that, like something important, something like a little bit more human to it. And then uh, once that the person comes in and they realize something and maybe follow, and um, and then like the, the movement of the sculpture um, allows that the person to move through the space and then realize that oh now I'm at the deep end of the space instead of at the bottom uh, or the beginning. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't have that that sort of good like a concise answer for it. But um, but that's a that's a that's something that I, I need to think about maybe write a book about. <laughs> but I think for folks, as, as you move around the sculpture, and you, when I look at it, and I've spent some time with it um, alone in here, and as the air moves through here and our bodies move past it, we're, we're influencing the, the movement of the piece. And, that, and I think that, that's all, you know, that may be, I'm just going to, project into your work a little bit, but maybe some of that, those painterly sensibilities there, because painting is such an immediate, um, and we have immediate, con depending on how long the brush is, of course, but, but we have a, this immediate contact with the surface and material. And, and I think when I relate to the sculpture and as I move through that this space, um, it's a bodily experience, like this thing, it, it moves, 
directionally through the space, but then also I'm interacting with how this thing forms and changes its form in subtle ways. So yeah, it's an open-ended thing. Yeah, it definitely allows you to, to be aware of your body. Because once you step back, you might hit something. Yeah. Yes, but I think I had a one more question. Yeah. I wish I, I should put that, that word on the, the microphone because I don't think I can iterate. So the, the people who are in YouTube probably couldn't hear. But, um, but he, she was mentioning about my daughter dancing and also um, the, about the paper and like the, the paper rings and connects. And, um, you know, I just made the thought that of her when um, that kind of activities, I, you know, in my family, when I was growing up, we often make my, uh, our own uh, New Year card. And so my father was the, the designer and the carver, and then we siblings have basically like two, three colors each. And then he would say, go, and then I'll put the red and then you know, blue here, and my sister will put another color, and then, and then like, my mother will come out to it with the paper, and then boom, and then you know, make it, and then peel it off, and then <laughs> let's go to another. So that kind of activity is um, little, little um, steps. I think it's maybe something that I, I like. This takes a you know, long time, and I know that, um, you know, I know that somebody helped, like a lot of people helped today, but three years ago, five years ago, um, like there is a, a, a chunk of time that um, uh, when, like, you know, my friend, or um, oftentimes my student, helped me like three hours a day, regimented sort of movement that we did together. And like, kind of, like, yeah, similar to the, your experience. So, so I come from Japan, and, um, and I'm in America, so Japanese, or Japanese-American, or American, and how do I, how people do want other people to remember me? So that, that was that. I think there was another part. But, um, that's a that's a categorization of someone, and that's like labeling myself. So probably, I just don't know, probably. Yeah, I don't know. Um, but as a legacy, uh, pro uh, perhaps I want people to remember me that like, oh, this Nishiki just always loved making things. How do I want people to remember? Um, maybe that's what I'm doing, but like, how do I want others to remember? Uh, well, I don't want them to remember that I'm, you know, 
Ah, iya, Bang Didi. Um, cultural aspect yeah Cult, yeah it's uh, it's changing uh, you know sometimes like the when i came so this is kind of a long story but when i came to america you know some 20 some years ago um I, you know i was i was not denying japanese but i was uh, i was trying to absorb a lot of culture and then realized that um well i don't really like what, 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 who am I? And one of the professors told me one time that you have, you, you can only paint what you know. And I was like, oh, yeah, of course. I mean, of course. So then I started to uh, more like visiting my culture that I grown up with, because I, I thought I knew, but maybe I didn't really know. Um, I don't know. I'm, I'm, it's a difficult question, but thank you so much for the question. <laughs> And I think I'm going to move on because I think I have my, the last question from my daughter. I don't think, I, won't, I don't want to keep you all, but yes. Why did you want to do Sumi Ink? Why did I want to do Sumi Ink? I think it's the calligraphy, the Japanese calligraphy that they use, Sumi, sumi Ink. That's actually a good question because I was not sure who, who, like what nationality, like what makes it me Japanese, what makes me American. Um, and so I needed to some sort of uh, the foundation, something that like ground me and calligraphy was the answer at that time. And that's how the, the Sumi Ink, it, it, it started becoming more pro, uh, like a primary medium. Thank you, Yusuke. Primary uh, uh, Primary, but main. Main, main medium. Uh, that's the question. Uh, sorry, that's the no. Yes, yes, Yusuke. Well, thank you, Yusuke. And uh, thank you all for coming. And feel free to, to hang around, and uh, if you have other questions that you'd like to ask or talk with uh, Nish Nishiki, um, not to the camera and everything, welcome to do so. Thanks. <laughs>